Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of Meet the Candidates. I am your host, Keisha Barrett, and in our studios today, we have Flint School Board candidate, Stephanie Hackney. Yes. That's correct. Thanks. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. Let's get right into the uh, questions that I think the people of the city of Flint want to know. What makes you run for the school board? Well, my husband and I have, we have three children, two of which are currently enrolled, one in preschool, so about to be enrolled in the Flint Community Schools. And this past last school year, we started the Kids Need Art program, which really, which provides free art education inside the elementary schools in Flint. And we've expanded to include a second elementary school this year. And I started attending the meetings so that we would know what was going to happen to affect our program before it happened. And I got very discouraged when I was attending the meetings. As an audience member and as a parent, you watch a lot of commotion and tenseness that doesn't have to do with the actual meeting itself and it doesn't seem like it's working as fluidly as it should. Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you a Flint native? I am. I was born and raised in Flint. I was a 2003 graduate of Flint Central, the last Indian class. All right, go Indian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, we had, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I attended Mott Community College and since then we've just, we've just stayed in Flint. Okay, good, good. What is the biggest issue? If day one you got elected, uh, what is the biggest issue that is plaguing the Flint School Board? Well, I know that most people are going to say budget. Okay. But the budget's been a problem for years. That's not a new issue. That's something that is in the process of being dealt with. Um, maybe not as well as it should have been, but it's in the process of being dealt with. I think a lot more attention needs to be focused on our secondary education, on our middle schools and our high schools. They are in complete disarray and we're bordering on rather than having educational institutions to building dropout factories okay okay why do you think that is well i was able to attend one of the schools yesterday actually and really toured a couple of classrooms spoke with a lot of teachers and it's a culmination of things it's not one specific thing it's these students are coming in we all know from rough backgrounds some of them not all there may or may not be help at home, what have you. They're coming in with their own set of personal issues outside of school. Mm -hmm. And then they're coming in, and a lot of them have been pushed through rather than being educated through the system. Gotcha. And so you have behavior problems mixed with the possibility of being slightly behind. And a lot of this, especially the middle schools right now, are facing overcrowding, but only in select courses. Mm -hmm. Not throughout the building, just in select courses. And when you have, you know, 30, 30, I'm sorry, 30, 35 kids with, who all have their own set of issues in one classroom about the size of this room, <laughs> you're going to have what is, is just utter chaos. I, had, I spoke to teachers yesterday, and the word that kept coming up wasn't teaching, it was management. It's management. It's management. Mm -hmm. they, I even asked three of them, do you feel that you've reached a single student this year? No. Now, we know that within impoverished areas, there are other extenuating factors that affect education. What are some of the solutions? What do we do in order to counteract that? Northwestern last year actually did a wonderful, wonderful thing. They teamed up with the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and they brought in a counselor who spent the entire year working with the seniors. And every single graduate, 100% of Northwestern's graduates in June of 2012 were accepted and had their financial aid started for either a vocational school, a two-year college, or a four-year university. Okay. That was 100% of their graduates. That's not, it's a wonderful, wonderful program, but it needs to be expanded to include younger grades and to include the students that are struggling to graduate or who didn't graduate. We need to really find something that catches those students before they fall completely through the crack. Okay. Now, and now, you talked in terms of the vocational program and the tuition, um, and I think that's an awesome program, but where do we start with them in kindergarten, in third grade, in the seventh grade? When they come to school, they're hungry. They don't have clothes. What Do you think that's a need or that needs to be a focus or it should be on having them focus on their scholastic career after high school? Which is more important? In school. 
Okay. It's hard to concentrate on, you know, your on memorizing your multiplication tables if like you said, you go home and you don't know if there's going to be dinner. Okay. The Flint Community Schools was recognized by the state and they now receive breakfast and lunch and any kid in the after school program receives supper. Okay. And there are a lot of churches that team up with local schools, not every elementary. This is this is the elementary specifically. Not every elementary, but they do the backpack program where they have um, I think it's, I want to say it's about 60 backpacks that the parent facilitators for the Title I fill with food, and it goes home with the kids over the weekend. Awesome. That includes snacks like Rice Krispies, full meals like macaroni and cheese for the whole family. Um, at one point, they teamed up with, um, I want, I'm not 100%, but I want to say it was the farmer's market. They were getting vegetables as well. So there was food going home, so there was a little bit of relief there. But a big part of why we see... The, especially the population drop in the Flint schools, is kids are moving from home to home to home to home to home. And when they do that, they move from building to building to building to building. And especially if, th that's hard on any student academically and emotionally, but especially if they have an IEP or a special education course, that sets them back a full academic year every time they transfer buildings. If they're lucky one year. A great way to stop that is to increase our social workers either through finding the funding somewhere on our own budget, which I understand is rough, or teaming with DHS or with a local university or what have you, and including social workers that are not only there to protect the students if they to pick up things like neglect or abuse, but are there, have an open door for parents to walk in and say, I'm confused, my consumers is about to be shut off, I'm going to have to move, I'm facing eviction, what are my options? They need to be readily available to the entire family, not just to that one student. And that needs to be in sorry, in every building, not just the elementaries. Gotcha. Let's take a few steps back. What is the role of a school board member? I think a lot of people don't understand what that means and what your actual job is. Explain that to our audience. A lot of people think that it means that you you actually operate and run the buildings. You don't. You have the ability to approve or deny uh, special funding to emergency repairs to buildings or things like that. You're really I'm trying to think of a good word to say it. <laughs> you're really not necessarily the boss, but you're a board and a unit that the administration is responsible to. They are accountable to the board. And it's really kind of a checks and balance system versus actually having a hands-on approach. That doesn't mean that the board can't suggest. That doesn't mean that the board can't tell the administration, parents are talking to me about this. What are you doing? They can guide the administration, but ultimately they don't have a direct hands-on effect on the buildings themselves. Okay. We got um, about 40 seconds left, Stephanie. Let me know. Let... Oh. I apologize. <laughs> Tell us more about the closings. I think that's something that our um, our constituents are concerned about is this closing and the overcrowding. If you were elected to the school board, what would you propose that the administration do about that? Unfortunately, closures are, closures are necessary. Our population is, especially for secondary education, is dwindling at a much faster pace than it should. But the way that we're doing the closings is wrong. And just like I talked about with the, the transition of students moving from this location or that location, when we close a building and we force them to move, and then next year we close that building and we force them to move to another, we're putting them behind. And I have been to several meetings where it has been specifically said, we don't have a long-term plan. Why do we not have a long-term plan? We're spending sinking fund millage dollars, especially Summerfield was a big point of argument over the summer because they approved a closed summer field. They just spent the previous year $1,600 per window to repair that building from the sinking fund millage, which is taxpayer dollars, and then they're going to close it the following year. There's no plan. They did. It did end up staying open. The, uh, the early childhood development took it over, and it's completely a preschool and early childhood development building, which is wonderful. But that was because they were met with resistance from the public. They were just flat out going to close it. And the way that we're closing buildings is wrong. It is necessary, but the way that we're doing it is wrong. Now, 
you we talked about budget earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, is a concern. It is a concern. Yes. Even though we have been dealing with this for years now, it still is a concern. If you are appointed to the school board, what would be some of your budget suggestions? How would you fix the budget or help to counteract some of the shortfalls? A big problem that I've noticed with the budget is, one, we're making vast cuts from single departments versus minor cuts from multiple departments. We are heavy hitting the arts has been eliminated. The, well, visual arts has. Instrumental and music does have in, appear in some buildings. We're making heavy cuts to what's considered elective courses, even though they're, they're obviously of value. Um, instead of taking, okay, 10% of the paper budget, print on both sides of a memo, or 10% of the utilities, we could team up with a local university and have their engineering students practice on our building. Install solar panels with a licensed and bonded professor. But you can cut down your utility costs. You can cut down your paper printing costs. You can cut down other costs versus on multiple departments versus taking from one central location or program. Also, we're losing money from the state. We're losing students, so we're losing dollars per student. The state has cut our per pupil funds anyway and our infrastructure payments. Millages is not an option. Our, our city can't support another one, especially when the one that we have now is not being managed to the best that it could be. But we could bring in, we could bring in fundraisers per school. In our last 30 seconds now, yes. Stephanie, make a plea to the public. Why should you be elected to the school board? Because I bring a parent's perspective. It is time to, I'm sorry, I bring a parent's perspective. It is time to bring our schools back to community hubs and to increase community involvement to keep them alive. All right. How can we contact you? I am both on Facebook at Stephanie Hackney for Flint School Board and then also at flintartproject at gmail.com. All one word. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephanie. Thank you. We'll be right back with our next candidate. See this frog? I add boiling water. No, wait, 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 wait. See that? He jumps out. Smart frog. Now this guy, he's just as smart, but he won't jump out. Could jump out, but he won't. Really? He'll just stay in the beaker as the temperature slowly rises, never noticing, until he boils alive. Why doesn't he just get out? I mean, if he can get out, he should just get out. Right? I still remember that night. Dad said, don't do anything stupid, be safe. We didn't think about what could happen. Like the call when we found out about the accident. I didn't even know they left the party. Don't do anything stupid. He never imagined the lawsuits, how it affect his life savings, our relationship, or his freedom. Dad thought he was being a cool dad that night. What I needed was a father. Underage drinking, when you host, everyone loses. Welcome back to another edition of Meet the Candidates. In our studios now, we have 68th District Court Judge Candidate, Jill Crutch Bauer. How are you this evening? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, what I want to start off with for the voters, I want you to tell me a little bit about yourself. What, okay. Where you're from and why you decided to run for the 68th District Court position. Okay. Um, well, to start out, I'm a graduate of Flint Southwestern. And I currently live in the city of Flint with my husband and three children. And I've lived in the city more than I've lived out of the city since my husband and I got married. 
I've always had my law practice in downtown Flint. And uh, before I was an attorney, I was a professor at U of M Flint, Mott, and Baker. And uh, since I've become an attorney, I've really focused more and more on representing disadvantaged populations of people. I've done a lot of court-appointed criminal work, criminal appeals, and I currently am the lead attorney for an attorney group that represents women in the child welfare system, which means our clients often have kids in foster care and we're working to make sure they have a fair chance to get their kids back and have their family put back together. And then I also do bankruptcy and mediation. Okay. Why do you think you're the best candidate? Well, I, I'm a very hard worker and I'm a creative problem solver and I would bring those qualities to the bench. I really care about the community, care about people. I'm, I'm very much a um, cheerleader for Flint. I want us to be um, something that is a model of efficiency and progressive thinking and, and innovation like we've been in the past. And I've got ideas to bring some of those qualities back to the court. Um, and I just am very uh, compassionate and patient. So I think in district court where people often represent themselves, I, I have the right personality to make people feel like they've had their day in court and you know that maybe they haven't gotten the decision that they wanted, but the process has been fair. Gotcha. Now, that's another question I think most people uh, find their self tackling with they usually feel like judges just they make rulings based on the law yes what are you going to do as a judge to help the condition of Flint well first of all uh, there are two two things I want to respond to first of all because I taught in a community college taught at Baker um, taught at U of M Flint I've had to develop good communication skills and so I've, I've had to develop an ability when to, under, to recognize when people don't understand. A lot of times when attorneys are in the courts, judges are in the court, we have this very um, confusing legal language that we all kick into. And, and I've really, especially doing criminal appeals, become concerned that a lot of people agree to situations, get into situations, and they do not understand what they're getting into and what's going on. So I think one thing that I can do is break things down into a way that and make sure that people understand. But And then a specific idea that I've developed coming out of my education background and my work with disadvantaged populations is just a very strong recognition of the education gap in our community and how that's tied to crime. And um, currently the focus has been on development of specialty courts in the system because they focus on problem solving. They pick a key problem that's leading to crime and they focus on improving or fixing that problem. And good examples are drug court, mental health court. We're even getting a veterans court here in Genesee County. I would like to start a literacy court program where we do intensive literacy repair for adults that can't read, get them reading at a high school level, help them get a GED, and then help them with the process of getting into college or trade school with the idea that if they stuck with that process and worked hard, they would have possibly the opportunity to get their charge dismissed. And that's the way that drug courts and mental health courts work. You can, you know, if you complete the program, you can get your charge dismissed. And just to be clear on this, I'm talking about nonviolent offenders that are already going to be on probation anyway. I just feel with a literacy court, I would have a way to make them engage in some self-improvement and give them an incentive of having their charge dismissed, but they would be better off at the end because they'd be in college or trade school. Okay. Where do you think the gaps are in the district court? Where do you think that they're failing? Where do I think district court is failing? Yes, what is not being done? What do you think that could be done better if you're elected to the 68th district court? Where are the gaps? Well, Right now, what the tools that we have available to us are, you know, arresting people, <laughs> following up on prosecution, incarceration, which is very expensive. We also don't have the capacity to incarcerate people at the level that we would need to to really shut down all the criminal activity. Um, we don't have the capacity or the money. And then we um, have, a, sometimes we have a probation department, sometimes we don't have a probation department. 
So I think we, I mean, we definitely need all of the things that are in place, but we also need to hit things from a more preventative perspective. Um, specialty courts aren't preventative completely because they're catching people that have already had contact with the system, but I think that we need more innovative programs to try to get people permanently out of trouble so that we don't have to deal with the same you know, population of people over and over again. And I believe that if we get people better educated in the future, we'll see kind of a trickle-down effect because they will make sure that their children are better educated. And I think more highly educated people tend not to get in trouble. When I sit up in circuit court during felony sentencing and the judges ask about the person's background, you don't hear a lot of people that are going to prison say that they have a college degree. That's true. That's true. Um, and with that said, as sitting with the on the court system, do you think there should be more of a partnership with the local community school district and the, the judicial system? Would you make that connection? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that, that whole um, it takes a village. Okay. It takes a community to provide support to people. You, If people feel connected to their community, I maybe this is idealistic, but I think if people feel connected to their community, they would be less likely to be destructive in their community. So I would like to partnership with a lot of community groups and get some mentorship going on with older men maybe who have been through the criminal justice system and by that I mean they've they've experienced incarceration and could possibly give some guidance to younger men about why they want to avoid that. Um, I think that we need to become more connected as a community and if we did that we would have less people feeling isolated and making you know some of the decisions especially violent criminal decisions that um, often lead to tragedy in our community. When you sat down with your family and you said, I'm going to run for a judge. What was the reason? What was the reason? Yes. Well, I had come up with this um, almost epiphany that education is, the, the education gap is a huge problem in our com community. Initially, I was realizing that in the context of the child welfare system, how many of the families, maybe they did all the services that they needed to do to get their kids back, but they couldn't get a job and afford a home and therefore that was a barrier to getting their kids back. So I originally recognized the gap in that context, but then I started realizing that it could apply to a broader population of people and it could um, help our community in a much broader sense. And so when I talked to my family about doing it, it was in coming from a desire to serve the community and try to do something innovative here that hasn't been done before that could possibly be copied in other communities with similar problems. And so it was a desire to just do something completely out of the box that might really not only help Flint, but also bring a positive image back to Flint. Okay. okay. For the people who don't know, what area does the 68 district court cover and what's kind of the process who would come before you what what types of crimes okay well 68th district court covers the city of flint okay. so flint township and all the communities that surround flint have their own courts in 67th district court 68th court district court does not only deal with criminal matters and the criminal the criminal piece is misdemeanors and the beginning of felony cases, the preliminary exams, pretrials for felony cases. 68th also deals with landlord-tenant manners, civil cases under 25,000, traffic cases. Those are predominantly the issues that people would come to 68th District Court. And because most people don't really get into a lot of trouble, 68th is the um, court where a lot of people might have contact that you know they might not have contact with circuit court okay um tell me a little bit more about your family your husband your kids are they at flint schools is that some of the reason why the education gap is so important to you well my husband is an attorney 
He uh, works for probate court as the probate court administrator. He's a former Flint school teacher. My mother was also a Flint school principal. Uh, I have three children. One of them is a sophomore at University of Michigan Ann Arbor. I have a daughter in the 11th grade and a son in the 8th grade and they go to Flushing schools. Uh, we moved from Flushing into Flint and so they were established at Flushing schools. We were able to keep them there. Uh, but the education gap is important to me because as someone who taught at the college level before I became an attorney, uh, I've always valued education and I just see that as a pathway out of poverty and a way to defeat some of the uh, trends for urban populations. Education is the, the great equalizer. I have to agree. Jill, if you had a minute with every voter in the city of Flint, what would you tell them? Why should we vote for you? Okay. Well, I'm just sincerely concerned about the situation in Flint and I'm very passionate about the ideas that I'm bringing to the table. I really want to see us do something creative and productive to bring disadvantaged populations of people into the mainstream so that they have the opportunity to have legitimate lives. And when I say a legitimate life, you know, get an education, earn a living, earn enough money where they can support their family and their children and do the kinds of things that um, we all would like to do to have quality of life. And so if you give me the opportunity to serve the city, I will bring all of my passion and energy and hard work to 68th District Court to make it, make my courtroom the best possible place to come to solve your problems. Jill, how can we get in touch with you? Uh, you can call my campaign at 965-8603. Leave a message and someone will return the call within 48 hours. Great. Jill Creech Bauer, 68th District Court candidate. Thank you. We'll be right back. your future at Mott Community College. Three, two, one, race. Hi, this is Jim Scroviero. We're here at Skid Marks Raceway. We're here racing our slot cars. It's made in Flint, and we're proud of it. Welcome back to Meet the Candidates. Again, I'm your host, Keisha Barrett. We have in our studio now, uh, Flint School Board President Antoinette Lockett. Hello, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you today? Good, good, good. good. We're going to get right to it. Tell mm -hmm. us why you want to stay on the Flint School Board. I want to stay on Flint School Board because we're right in the middle of make, making some significant gains. Um, I'd like to finish up some of the things that, that has been started since I've been there. Probably shouldn't say finish up, but continue to work on moving the district forward and creating a great school system for the children in the Flint Community Schools. Okay. For the viewers who don't know who you are, not familiar with you, can you give us a little background? 
Um, like you said, my name is Antoinette Lockett. I've been a resident of Flint since um, 1980, and uh, I have three children. They attended Flint Community Schools. I have two that graduated from Flint Schools. And my experiences with um, my children in Flint Schools, I wanted something that I wasn't seeing, and uh, I decided instead of not having it, to decide to do something about it. That's what inspired me to run for the school board. Okay. You've been on the board since 2007, is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. What is the biggest issue plaguing the school board today? There is no biggest issue. We have big issues. Okay. Um, of course, our finances, you know, finances is everybody's issue. However, uh, Flint Community Schools is in a unique situation where we have uh, the declining tax base, uh, uh, current enrollment issues related to the um, reduction in citizens in the Flint Community Schools. So not only is uh, Flint population declining, which leads to enrollment declining, which impacts funding, we also have issues when it comes to um, we have finances, we have our academic challenges, meeting the needs of all students. We have a high poverty rate, which brings in additional issues for our students. Do they come to school ready to learn? Do they come to school where they want to be engaged in what it is we have to offer, the daily teaching that goes on? Are they receptive to those things? Our children have, uh, it, they deal with issues that are beyond what children should be dealing with that impacts their readiness to come to school and learn. We also have the issue of um, stabilizing our workforce, our employee pool, constant layoffs and recalls. We have to address that, find a way to stabilize those. And all of those are impacted by um, funding and grants, federal grants, state grants, which have a lot of guidelines within them that impact the way we do business and how we conduct business. So we have two issues, basically. We have our academic issues and we have our operational issues okay. that we have to address. And like I said, they're all so complex, they're intertwined. So to say one is greater than the other, they are just all great and we have to work on them all together at the same time. Okay. Well, let's break them up. Let's talk about the academics. Yes. Um, Poverty mm -hmm. is definitely one of the key reasons why some of the academic issues uh, are happening. Mm -hmm. What do you think that you can do as a school board member to, or what would you propose, mm -hmm. I should say, to help with the poverty issues and then connecting those with g more gains in academics? Uh, one of the things that the Flint Community School does to deal with the poverty issues that, is that we have grants that identify uh, certain positions that we can have. We have parent facilitators who uh, address the needs of the parents. They try to engage parents coming into the schools and working with parents to help them become, uh, give them strategies in dealing with issues. And not to say that because they participate in that, they are parents of poverty. I'm not saying that. I'm saying because of the poverty rate, that's one of the positions that we can address. We have behavior specialists who, in addition to our counselors and social workers, help assist students in um, addressing their behavioral needs. We have children sometimes come to school hungry. Mm -hmm. And through the grace of God and teachers and other support people, there's oftentimes that they have little snacks for them. We ha offer breakfast. We have, of course, lunch. Some kids on the weekends get certain uh, lunch packet, uh, meal packages to take home with them for the weekend. Um, and those are, those are the needs of children. Does it say that children that have those situations going on can't learn? No, it makes it more difficult to learn. We have to have high expectations and set standards no matter who they are or where they come from. And that's very critical for us. We have to have a common language of what our expectations are and what standards we we're going to establish and follow through on. Okay. Now, the second part, which is the finances mm -hmm. we discussed, um, what is being proposed by the school board at this point to kind of counteract some of those financial woes? We've done a tremendous job with our finances. Um, we have to fine tune our monitoring of our finances from the board's perspective, um, our role as board members. We have to really understand what that budget is, 
what's implied in that budget, and how does that, are we truly budgeting to fit the needs of the district to achieve our educational goals? I think we are. Um, one of the things we've done, we've current, we recently had a um, organizational review done by Plan Moran, which identified areas that we can look at to help address reducing costs. It also revealed what things that we were doing were best practices to help us. Um, are, are what it, are the things that we're doing? Are they fiscally sound? So, the results of the study was very good. Um, it showed that we are doing things in line with the direction that we're going in to make us a more self-sufficient district, uh, a district that will be working towards gaining a surplus or a fund balance, which we don't currently have. Um, and then we also have to make sure that when we talk about our finances that we are truly being responsible, and we are being responsible. Many times uh, there are things that are outside of your control that you have to deal with, but we find a way to deal with it. Okay. For our viewers, a lot of people are not familiar what a school board member is or what an elected school board person does. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your role? The role of a school board member is a governing team. We don't get in and do day-to-day -day management of the district. We don't run programs. We establish and adopt policy to guide the ongoings within the district, to guide the academics as well as the operations. Um, we establish the policy. Administration does regulations to go along. How are they going to go about doing that? As a governing body, a team of people, we accept recommendations brought forth by the superintendent. Those recommendations are the working tools that she needs or whoever the superintendent will be it or is that they need to carry out their chief executive position operations. So it's the tools that they need. So when it comes to the board, we have to decide whether or not um, we agree with that. If we don't agree, what other options are there? So we have that discussion about that. And in most cases, we approve those recommendations. Gotcha. Now, as uh, talking to the viewers and in terms of voting, mm -hmm. would you say that there are specific skill sets that we should be looking for, for the voting public when we're uh, considering school board members? Oh, I think there is a skill set that you have to care, of course. Let's get that out the way. Um, you need to be able to work with people. You need to have an understanding of educational issues on a national level, a state level, and of course your local level within the district. You have to be knowledgeable about the operations of the district. Um, you have to be able to think critical about the issues that are coming forth. You have to be committed to the job. You need to take the time to educate yourself, prepare yourself for board meetings, be committed to attending board meetings, and do the job in a respectful manner and um, it, that, that, that's, that's the biggest part, working with the team and staying focused on the mission. And the mission is to, be, to educate children in this district so that they are productive citizens okay. when they leave. Now earlier you spoke about um, you've made some specific gains. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more in detail about what those gains have been since you've been on the school board? Okay, we established a strategic plan. Um, I think that was in 2008 that was finalized. Prior to that, we hadn't had a strategic plan, I think since maybe the early 90s. So we had to update our, our plan on what, how do we intend to educate children. So we got that accomplished. We also did a facilities plan and with the facility plan, as you know, with declining enrollment, we have many buildings, and we just have too many buildings um, for the number of students. So with that facility plans, we identified what schools to close and in what order. That was a major accomplishment, and we are continuing to work that plan also. Um, our next major challenge is going to be how do we raise the achievement gap faster? That's the biggest challenge from my perspective is addressing that achievement gap 
and uh, making all of our children successful. Okay. Uh, obviously, there was some controversy um, regarding the closing of the schools and which schools should be closed. Mm -hmm. How do you feel the school board handled that? Oh, I think we handled it well. No matter what school is chosen, we'll have that controversy. Okay. That's just a fact. No one wants it to happen in their neighborhood or their school. That's human nature. You know, it's almost like when you grow up in a home and you, you leave that home, but your parents are still there. And what happens when it's time for that home to become vacant? You know, you have attachments, sentimental value. So all of that is understandable, but with change, change is not easy, and we have to make changes. Okay. Ms. Lockett, yes. we're going to vote on uh, November 6th. What do you want to tell your voters? I would like to say to my voters, excellence in the classroom begins with excellence in the boardroom. For Flint Community Schools to move forward, citizens have to make a conscientious decision to elect leaders who are principal leaders, who are responsible governors, who understand the educational issues for Flint Community Schools, and who understands the operations of Flint Community Schools. I am that candidate. Vote for Antoinette Lockett, November 6th. Thank you. How can we contact you? Uh, my email is boardmemberlockett at comcast.net. My home number is 810-637-5549. Thank you, Ms. Lockett. You. We had Antoinette Lockett here, uh, president of the Flint School Board looking for re-election. We'll be right back with the next candidate. runs red. Let's stop hate crimes. For more information, contact the Michigan Alliance Against Hate Crimes. Young men of color, come up from the gloom of national neglect. You have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame, bright beyond the telling of it. Kwanzaa means access. It means access to your soul. It means access to your people. Kwanzaa is like renewing your annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly, to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectedness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jakulia, self-determination. Welcome back to Meet the Candidates. I'm still your host, Paul Herring, and we're here with another candidate running for, I believe you're running for the county treasurer seat, right? County clerk. County clerk seat. Uh, John Gleason, right? There you go, yeah. All right, but before we get to him, I need to, I'm going to do this every time you see my face, all right? I'm going to encourage you to not only vote, but to get your friends, your family members, your neighbors, get them out there and vote. It is too important. We cannot sit on our hands this time, all right? Now, with that said, I'm going to give John Gleason an opportunity to introduce himself to some of you and to reintroduce himself to others. John? Hey, thanks. For let me, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. The treasurer's job does sound pretty good, doesn't Not it? Not bad, huh? They got all the money. <laughs> well, I'm actually John Gleason. I'm a state senator today. I served eight years on the county commission. That's where I got acquainted, actually, with the clerk's position because they're actually the clerk. Mm -hmm the secretary, if you will, of the County Board of Commissioners. So I served there eight years. I served two terms in the House of Representatives in Lansing. 
and now I'm currently a state senator serving the 27th district, which makes up about two-thirds of Genesee County. And um, now I'm running for the county clerk's job, which most people would know it's being consolidated now with the Register of Deeds. Right. Right. So it's going to be an interesting move for me. I, I'm ready. I always enjoyed the county work. I'm a guy that enjoys the public and the people, and uh, I'm really glad to be coming back home, to be honest with you. Great. What, uh, I guess, what makes you qualify for this position? Well, I was a hard-working man. I, we talked before I came on here. I was actually a construction worker. I'm a skilled tradesman. Okay. So I have an associate degree from my community college. It did a lot of uh, studying with the, with the business okay. uh, courses there and uh, surpassed the needed credits by many. I went to Northern Michigan University for a few years, so I have some education in that uh, realm also. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing that I bring to the table is knowing what we are not doing. Okay. Uh, you began the show today by telling people to go vote and take someone with you. We have a dismal record of yes. having our citizens go vote. We don't have to look too far back. When Nelson Mandela, when he was released from the unjust prison right. sentence that he was given, literally people in Africa, they walked two weeks barefoot, many of them, to go vote, to cast their vote for their representative. When you see what happened overseas on a daily basis, people in Libya, Sir, in Syria, even Northern Ireland, where the people were, uh, they were denied their access to publicly elected representation. We are not doing all that we can. I, I think we have to educate the public more than the 90-day election cycle. Uh, I intend to go into schools. I'm in schools nearly every week. Mm -hmm. I have a program that I'm very, very proud of. Um, we call it Football Fridays, okay. where I actually go into the local elementary schools, mm -hmm. and we sit down with the kids and their teachers. We go down the cafeteria. I want to know what kind of food we're serving them. But we go down the cafeteria. We all get our trays. Okay. Then we go back to the classroom, and we spend a half an hour talking about bullying. Okay. There's a lot of bullying in the election cycle today, too. The election world is kind of being pushed around, and, and, and it shouldn't be. But um, then we go out and we play football for a half an hour to get the kids not only to see what they're eating, but also to discuss the concerns that they have, what we might do better mm -hmm. as elected officials and as a state with the bullying mm -hmm. issue. Then we go outside and play football. So that we can reinforce, look, we're all in this world together. Play, you're all teammates. Mm -hmm. You're going to get that fly, aren't you? I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm concerned because we haven't been fair. And when you haven't been fair many times, you've been unjust. I know you can never, I guess you can never start too soon, okay? Uh, elementary school is great, but what are we doing for perhaps the juniors and the seniors in high schools, so the ones that are going to be voting this year? And next. And they don't vote. We don't encourage them enough. I would like to see, I actually had a bill passed signed into law that I wish we would see a little more vigor put behind. I want our kids to learn life skills. I had a bill that was signed into law by Governor Granholm to teach our kids not only math, English, science, mm -hmm. but I want them to know the social sciences as well. Your civics, your economics, and your social studies. Okay. It used to be important. Um, I'm the grandson of immigrants to this country. It used to be important that people knew what our country stood for, the Constitution. But I see this being uh, obliterated today. I think that our Constitution is under attack. It's certainly for sale. You can see that this year, the numerous ballot proposals, because people couldn't get what they wanted through the typical political process, the legislative process. So now they load up our ballot. And I find that cumbersome and I find that also unjust. Even though we're given that process to address our government through a petition form, mm -hmm. I think when you load up your ballot, it's such a cumbersome state mm -hmm. that you're going to disenfranchise a lot of people. They're going to turn and turn and turn another page to dissect and vote in their ballot. Many people are going to alert. They're going to look at the length and the wordiness of the proposals, and they're not going to vote for them. So okay. we've, we've, I think we've shut out them from the process of addressing their government because of the cumbersome, the numerous proposals that we have. And everybody said, well, this, this is 
our government, this is democracy. Well, it really isn't. When you get so many, particularly in a presidential election cycle, mm -hmm. when the lines are longer, you already have a, a trouble. But you got the most voters in, there a, you in, go. in, in, in a presidential thing. And now this is what's troublesome to me. We have the numerous statewide proposals, but we also have many county proposals. And it's not unusual for local communities to have ballot proposals for police or fire or a road millage as well. So we're, our ballots are getting, I think, too long and too irresponsible for the typical well, voter. John, what do, you, what do you say to the person that, that accuses you of being a, a career politician? Well, certainly I'm not. I mean, I <laughs> took a lot of courses. I'm, I'm college educated. Uh -huh. um, but also, I got a degree. I mean, I have a uh, journeyman card and as a skilled tradesman. I never ran for any office until I was 38 years old. I worked 20 years. I've had a job since I was 12. I, somebody has written me a paycheck since I was 12 years old. Okay. I'm not a career politician. I think a career politician is someone that begins their life in politics. I worked hard. I would suggest from 70 until about, well actually 72 until about 79, I worked in the Buick Foundry almost every summer under contractual work. Okay. Worked in the Pontiac Foundry. I was really enlightened about life needs. I worked on a nuclear power plant up in Midland when they were constructing that. Worked on the Buick powerhouse. They're talking about renewable energy mm -hmm. and supplying our state with the base load required to run manufacturing. I've worked on these plants. Worked on sewage treatment plants. People want to talk about environmental issues. I've worked on the sewage treatment plant on Beecher Road in the city of Flint and out in Owasso. Let me ask you this. What do you think it takes to be a good county clerk? What are the, I mean, the characteristics that you put well, to that you job that are going to make you successful? Yeah, you have your statutory obligations. You're the clerk of the county board of commissioners, as I mentioned earlier, the clerk of the circuit court. You have the most intimate responsibility. All of us remember when our children were born. You have the birth certificates. And then you have probably the most distressful, the most trying time of your life, your death certificates. Okay. Um, your personal protection orders are handled by the county clerk's office. So just about all the most intimate details are dispersed at that county clerk's office. I'm going to pay close attention to that office. But I think we have another issue that's somewhat troubling as well. The Register of Deeds was consolidating those two offices. Okay. Now, we have to get up to date. Uh, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work hard to bring in the necessary technology. There's one thing about a piece of equipment. You don't ne necessarily pay health care or a pension on it. Our legacy costs are really destroying our local and state budgets. The long-term commitment. I treat every worker with respect. I'm really proud of this. My family has paid the price of war. Mm -hmm. For generations, my family has paid the price for war. Okay. Our nephew was killed in Iraq and this troubling time right now over in Iraq. He was killed, one of the first killed from Genesee County. We know, my family knows what that price of freedom, what the ability to go vote. There's a terrible cost. People that look like you expended a lot of personal cost right. in the 50s and 60s so that we could go vote. That's dear. But they also, we have to worry about that Register of Deeds office. So I see this as a great opportunity. I've already made a commitment and I'm working hard on it. I did some more work this morning working with the many agencies here in Genesee County and Genesee County itself and the state mm -hmm. and the veteran organizations such as the VFW. I am making a commitment that I'm going to hire disabled veterans. I am given a chance to put a team in place in both offices. I'm given a chance to put deputies and those I think that need to work for me. Mm -hmm. The top of the pecking order is going to be disabled veterans. I'm making a firm commitment. I want them to get a job. Well, listen, in light of a shrinking budget everywhere, statewide, citywide, countywide, your office is actually losing employees. How do you plan on bolstering the budget of that office to do these things? Well, they're given a, they're given a, a technology budget to bring in new uh, resources uh -huh. to, to better serve the public. But we have to do our homework. I've already started establishing, I'm going to make a circuit. I'm going to start out with Oakland County, Washington County, Ingham County, visit the other counties, 
that are further advanced than we are mm -hmm. in serving the public. I, you know, when you do things, you just learn. You learn sitting at this table talking to the numerous characters that you that you uh, interview. But we learn from doing things, right? When I, you know, I've got a good relationship with the Secretary of State. Now I think she's been wrong about trying to disenfranchise voters, mm -hmm. um, checking the box whether you're a U.S. citizen or not. My God, let's be real. Right. We know who's going to vote. Number two, I support and always have advocated for same-day registration of voters. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have a trouble in Flint, Michigan, or Genesee County, or the nation as a whole, with too many people voting. Right. Just as you began your show, Listen, we got to get people to vote. Let me give you um, a couple seconds to look right at the camera, talk to the people at home, and convince them to cast their vote for you. Well, I want your vote. And one of the most important reasons why I want your vote is because I'm for everybody. I started the Disability Caucus in Lansing because everybody had a caucus. The banks, the environmental group, the workers, everybody had a caucus except the disabled. I've made a full commitment my whole public life. I was the voice, I was the voice 15 years ago that said let's make our county buildings accessible. You can't say that you're for full democracy if your voting polls are not accessible. Three quarters of the voting booths and polls in our state are not accessible to the disabled. I can offer a unique perspective on that and make sure that we have the accessibility addressed. I want everybody to vote. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate you being here. You guys, it's Meet the Candidates. You're watching Fact Channel 17, and I got to appreciate you for that. Again, get out and vote. Fill up that car. There'll be more after this. annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectedness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jakulia, self-determination. Lead in Flint and proud of us. I'm Sophia Taylor and I am made right here in Flint, Michigan. Born and raised, rehabbing the hood and I'm proud of it. This is Gary Jones coming to you live from downtown Flint and I'm made in Flint and proud of it. My name is John Wood. I'm made in Flint and proud of it. I'm Laura Paddock. I'm making it in Flint and proud of it. I'm Molly Paddock.